So I think this is a, for for our group and also for me personally, since Alex is the, the first uh, PhD student to uh, defend his thesis from our group. Uh, so I want to spend just a couple of minutes, uh, I guess, talking about Alec and his kind of story with uh, with our group. Uh, so the first time I, I talked to him was about five years ago. So he reached out uh, right before the PhD admission cycle, expressing an interest in our group and seeing if we had some positions. I have this like really vivid memory of like chatting with him and coming away uh, massively impressed, uh, not just by his like technical background, but also by his enthusiasm. Uh, and I felt that this was going to be someone who was going to really make things happen. Uh, and that's exactly the, the kind of person I needed uh, as we were starting off uh, our, our group. Uh, and yeah, looking back at the last uh, four and a half, five years, uh, I was not wrong. Uh, it's really incredible to, to see all the, the, the different things that uh, that I could uh, have made happen. So his research, I'll, I'll let him explain, uh, is on making formal guarantees on, on safety and performance uh, for robotic systems that are uh, using learning and, and deep learning in particular. Uh, and yeah, he has some really uh, impressive demonstrations uh, all the way from theory to algorithms to the hardware implementation on, on drones and, and other platforms. Uh, I'll let him tell that story. Uh, the one thing you won't see uh, in the in the talk is the incredible amount of hard work, uh, discipline, and enthusiasm that that went into uh, making these results possible. So this is as one example. Uh, our lab space out in, in Forest Hill when Alec joined was basically this empty space with a, a white hand system that we've never used. And Alec basically single-handedly, I think, uh, transformed that, that space into a fully functioning space uh, Yeah, where, where we're using it uh, regularly uh, now, uh, like setting up all the infrastructure, software, hardware, all the tools, uh, storage cabinets, or, organizing the, the space and so on. And he did that not just with, uh, with that space, but with a lot of our other uh, software and, and hardware uh, infrastructure as well. Uh, I guess the other thing I want to point out that you won't see really in, in the talk today is Alex Menekis of both undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, so I think I counted eight uh, undergraduate students that Alex has officially mentored. Uh, a lot of the papers you'll see referenced today are actually co-authored with, uh, with undergrad students. Uh, and many of those students themselves have, have gone on to uh, PhD programs at other universities. Uh, and yeah, I guess the, the final thing uh, that you won't see directly in that talk today is uh, Alex's contributions to our teaching mission here at Princeton, so helping us uh, develop and, and grow the intro to uh, robotics course, uh, especially during the pandemic year when we had to somehow figure out how to ship 50 different robots to 50 different students across the world uh, and then make sure that the robots actually ran uh, throughout the semester, which they, they did. Uh, so after Princeton, Alec is off to Boots, which is uh, Amazon's uh, self-driving car effort, where he'll be working on the planning and, and control team. Uh, so Alec, yeah, we're really excited to, uh, to see your talk. Uh, yeah, I'm incredibly fortunate to have you uh, uh, with our group for the last five years. Yeah, and we look forward to your work at, at Zoops, uh, and hopefully riding in one of your Zoops uh, vehicles yeah. uh, sometime in the near future. So then I will take it over. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Ani. I'm really grateful for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming both on Zoom um, and in person. Um, so yeah, this is the, the title of my thesis, Pro uh, Provably Safe Learning-Based Robot Control, the Anomaly Detection and Generalization Theory. So let's just start off with some motivating robotic examples. So we have like a robotic arm here picking up a mug, some something a little bit more static um, and potentially like not safety critical or you know a drone avoiding obstacles. And then we can sort of build up the complexity from these somewhat more simple systems. So an aerial manipulator with complex dynamics, you know, a go one robot, which has hybrid dynamics, you know, interacting with the ground. And then even more with, you know, agility robotics or autonomous cars, which are interacting with other humans on the roads. And we're really motivated by these systems because we want, you know, intelligent robotic systems to interact with humans, interact with a, you know, complex dynamic world. Um, and so we want these robots to interact with us, but, you know, they need to be safe for, for them to interact in our world and, and operate with humans. And so what we want to do is we want to learn control policies which perform well in new environments, but not just perform well, because it's not enough to just say, oh, my ro robot won't fail very often. We need them to be safe and guaranteed, um, try to provide some sort of notion of guarantee of the performance in, in new environments. So why is this challenging in the first place? I'll, I'll give this, this really uh, sort of funny video of someone who's testing the Tesla self-driving um, car. So this car um, you know, has a self-driving mode, which is trained with millions and millions of, of real world driving data. Um, from other humans and you know, simulated miles. And many engineers are working on the system to try to get it to be as safe as possible and as effective as possible. And this YouTuber is testing out the self-driving car mode to see if it works well in practice on this you know, road that this car maybe has never driven before, but it ends up failing on this seemingly simple environment. We put a bucket in front of the Tesla and it can't stop in time. It just drives right through. 
and so we you know test a bigger object maybe the bucket was too small and it and the person has to sort of avoid um, the maneuver and you can see here that it's actually detected as a human which is especially bad so the tesla knew you know thought that this was a human and still wasn't able to avoid the obstacle and he goes on to test with uh, you know larger and larger objects and ends up testing with um with this truck pulling out in front of the tesla and he has to end up stopping the car um and you can see at the end of it end of the video he's sort of confused by how bad this system is working and this is sort of the challenge of, of working with generalization so this system has um many learning based components um how can we get the system to perform well in new in new settings like the one that we saw here so i'll sort of set the stage with with a problem setup so let's take this parrot swing robot which is you know somewhat simpler and doesn't have as many interactions that we have to deal with but we'll still find that it's uh, challenging um to work in new settings um so we you know have our parrot swing and we want to operate in some office setting let's say navigate from point a to point b avoiding you know doors and obstacles and things like that so we train our robot and we train it on another office setting and another one and then finally we're going to test in some new office setting that we haven't seen before so this is going to be our new environment and the question we're trying to answer is can we guarantee that this robot will perform well in this new set so that's the sort of first question but what's even more is what happens now when we have disturbances such as like a human that we haven't seen in training before or a different lighting conditions such as a different time of day can we perform well in this setting and even more what happens if we have sort of a context switch let's say we're now working in residential buildings which may have like staircases which we haven't seen before can we perform well in this setting so i'll talk a little bit about the technical challenge with uh, trying to do this in the first place we're working with complex dynamic robots so robots such as the swing which is a vertical takeoff like a quad rotor but it switches to fixed wing flight and the dynamics of, of actually controlling that are, are somewhat complicated or hybrid dynamics like this go one that interacts with the ground we're dealing with high dimensional sensor input such as rgb depth or lidar in the case of autonomous vehicles or larger scale robots and we also have a dynamic and interactive environments that are potentially unknown so this this video is from um, from nvidia showing the lidar scans um, and some of the objects that are detected um, by autonomous car and we have to keep track of all these objects and still you know perform safely using these high dimensional sensor inputs and this is this is part of the challenge and so there are two sorts of approaches that that my research has has taken to sort of, sort of address this the first one is to try to determine when we're going to be unprepared for these settings in the first place or on anomaly or out of distribution detection and just as a side note this is chapters three four or five in my thesis if you, if you want to take a look at um, the particulars um, and then the more general problem of can we just work in those new settings so out of distribution generalization um, and this is uh, chapter six and seven in my thesis and so i'll talk more about um, each of these after i uh, go through sort of a background um, but the first thing i'll do is start with a related work in each of these areas and talk about how my work is is different go through some background and then i'll go into this first um, section and a, a large majority of the talk will be in the anomaly or out of distribution uh, detection setting just for the interest of time um, but i'd be happy to talk about um, the other work more Okay, so let's talk about uh, related work in the detection area. So anomaly detection has been around detecting when there's something anomalous or something unfamiliar in the environment, including with high dimensional sensor inputs. The sort of, as for example, images detecting when an object, you know, something that we haven't ever seen before. The challenge here is that we're not able to provide any notion of task relevance. Is that object important to our policy? Let's say it's a tree 200 feet away that we detect as anomalous. That's probably not going to impact the plan, you know, of our obstacle avoidance or our autonomous car. So um, more recent work has worked on uh, trying to get task relevance into the system for um, uh, reinforcement learning uh, anomaly detection, but ultimately it's not able to make you know strong guarantees about how safe the or you know uh, about the detection itself. So we can't guarantee that we will detect anomalous things. Um, and and some work has provided notions of confidence or guarantees, but ultimately they tend to require really specific training architectures or really specific guarantees, and they don't tend to hold in general. And so in the work that I'll show you, uh, we're going to be able to provide strong notions of guarantees with task relevance and in the sort of meaningful, meaningfully improve the safety of the robots that we're, that we're working with. Another sort of work that I'll talk about is in, in failure prediction. And so moving away from sort of the learning side of things, we can also use things like in, inevitable collision sets. So trying to determine if another object could possibly crash into us or another agent could possibly crash into us. Um, such as with Hamilton Jacoby reachability. Um, and ultimately, these methods tend to be quite conservative because you're assuming worst case behavior of other agents. And so we're going to try not to assume um, the worst possible thing about other, other agents. And also another method is, for example, control barrier functions, which are great in general, but you do need knowledge about the environment that you're going to be operating in in order to provide these sorts of uh, safety guarantees. And the last sort of topic, which I'll just touch on and, and sort of circle back to at the 
at the end of the future work is uh, with conformal prediction, which is able to provide sort of a notion of confidence and error bounds, but requires different sorts of assumptions that are difficult to, to satisfy, which I'll, I'll get more into at the, the very end of the talk. And sort of the second half, which will lead into, I guess, the approach that we take to actually do this is on generalization. So I guess earlier uh, approaches to robust control are such as H infinity control or chance constraint programming. And these systems are really great when you have knowledge about the types of environments you're going to encounter. So for example, if you know you're not going to encounter a wind disturbance greater than two meters per second, then you can use H infinity control to ensure the safety of your robot in any setting with, you know, with a limited um, disturbance. Um, but ultimately they require knowledge about the about the environment that you're going to be operating in. And similarly with uh, partially observable Markov decision pro processes and approximate um, upon DPs, it's they require knowledge about the environment. Since this is going to be a key assumption that we're trying to avoid, we don't want to know what these office spaces look like ahead of time. We just, just want to know, okay, we're going to be in some office space. We don't know any sort of structure beyond that. And there are also deep learning based approaches to try to provide generalization, such as rapid motor adaptation, which has become really popular in legged locomotion. And in this work, they try to sort of fit uh, parameters about the environment, such as friction um, and you know lighting and things like that um, into the model. But ultimately, they can't provide any no notions of guarantees on the systems, which is sort of the difficult thing for, for learning based approaches. And so the main sort of theoretical framework we're going to end up using um, comes from supervised learning. It's a uh, PAC based generalization. So PAC stands for probably a, approximately correct. And it comes from um, you know, this McAllister paper, and I'll talk more about exactly what this bound looks like. But ultimately, for a supervised learning setting, we're able to provide a guarantee about how well you know, some, some hypothesis for supervised learning will perform on new uh, uh, samples. Um, and and we'll, I'll show you how we uh, use this bound. And there are also other sorts of generalization guarantees, uh, such as algorithmic stability, um, which classify um, you know, the performance of a policy based on, on the sensitivity to training data and things like that. So let's uh, make the, the problem uh, more formal. We're given a task T, which for example, is to navigate through the, you know, the obstacle, uh, this obstacle field, such as um, this uh, office space. And this environment is gonna be drawn from some unknown distribution over office spaces. And so the sort of key assumption that I mentioned before is we're not gonna assume anything about this distribution. We're only gonna be able to get samples from it. So for example, the distribution over office space buildings, um, but we only get uh, examples of it. We have some sort of dynamics given by you know, this function f of e for our, our little swing robot. And we have some sort of sensor, which could be depth or an RGB camera. Um, and it specifically is high dimensional because we want to make sure these work with larger scale systems. We're going to have some sort of policy, which is going to take these sensor measurements and output them um, into you know, a trajectory in the environment. And then we can assign a cost to the trajectory of the environment. And so this cost here is going to operate directly on the policy that we're trying to learn. So let's say the policy results in a trajectory that goes you know, around through a couple corridors and ends up reaching the goal without crashing, then we can assign that a cost of zero. If it ends up crashing or doesn't reach the goal, we can assign a cost of one. And sort of the objective of, of generalization is we're trying to find a policy such that for any new environment, any new office space that we sample or that we see, we're going to perform well in, in practice. We're going to perform well on average. Um, and so all of the sorts of guarantees we're going to make are in expectation. Um, that's something to note. And so I just use the shorthand for this distribution over environments. Given a policy, we're trying to minimize the total cost or the, the expected cost that we see. And something that I won't get too much into detail, but we'll need to carry around a little bit in order to use pack based generalization is we need to learn a distribution over policies. Um, and this comes from some of the requirements of randomization um, as part of uh, uh, many machine learning algorithms in order to provide stronger guarantees in practice. So um, the sort of to give a, a concrete example of this, assume we have this task of navigating to this goal space and then this unknown distribution as before, we're going to be given a training data set of, of environments, as I've been saying, and we were going to be tested on a new environment. So this is exactly just restating on the previous slide. And, the, and exactly what the pack based guarantee gives us is with high probability or one minus delta, um, we're going to be able to bound the expected cost on new environments by a training cost, cost plus a regularizer term. And so what this looks like in terms of the uh, optimization problem I showed before, this is the exact cost that we were trying to minimize in the previous slide. And we're going to be able to upper bound this exactly with the training cost, which you know we have because we have samples of the environment, and a regularizer term, which de just depends on parameters of the of the problem, which I won't get uh, too much into detail in this talk. But ultimately, what we what we can do is through optimization or gradient descent, we can minimize this upper bound and synthesize a policy that also has a guarantee on it. So what we can say is, you know, with high probability, we'll succeed on you know this upper bound, ninety five percent of future environments. 
and this is 95%, you know, in expectation. So it's possible that we'll encounter an environment and fail, but on average, we should see a 95% success rate. So for the hardware setup for this sort of background example, we're using our parrot swing and, you know, we're navigating through an obstacle field. And this is an example I'll, I'll use sort of recurring um, throughout this talk. So the task um, is the drone must navigate through this obstacle field. Um, we're going to be given a data set of simulated in environments um, and try to minimize this upper bound. And the distribution of our environments, this unknown distribution, it's known to me because I designed the problem, but it's it's unknown to the robot, um, is just randomly placing these obstacles, just like uh, a set number of them, I think it was 12 in this example, um, throughout the environment to, to try to make it avoid. And uh, the sensor input we're going to get is a, a first person depth image from the from the perspective of the drone. And the output is just a trajectory through the environment. So just sort of a really simple um, obstacle avoidance problem. So we train this and the result is a policy which can avoid obstacles in environments. And let's see what the, the policy does in practice. So you can see that we're able to avoid some obstacles and I'll play this stick for a little bit um, with the volume fighter. The guarantee that we get when we compute that upper bound, the thing that we were trying to minimize, is that the policy should succeed on 93% of new environments in practice. And, and empirically, we see that that's approximately satisfied 28 out of 30 environments in hardware. Um, so we have different views. And I think uh, I'll show you this one, which is a crash. So um, I guess the key challenge here is that these training distributions, the thing that we're training on is also what we're testing on. And this in practice is really unrealistic. If I want to train my robot in the lab or in simulation, and now I test it in the real world or you know on the streets, um, there's been a distribution shift and our guarantee doesn't hold anymore. And so this is one of the key challenges that I'm trying to address. Um, and that's exactly um, how the sort of first part of my research comes in, which is to try to do anomaly detection or out of distribution detection. Can we tell when we're actually out of this of the setting that you know different from our setting um, that we trained in? And if we are in a different setting, can we still ensure the safety of our robot? Um, so the setting, you know, just to be more specific with these, these uh, uh, training uh, sort of in, in the same setting with office spaces is we have, you know, the same training set as we saw before. And now we're being tested with some sort of distribution shift that we don't know anything about. It could be anything. It doesn't actually have to be office buildings. But, you know, in practice, if we want to test in one office building, now we go to a different one, there won't be a huge context shift. And so the intuition we're going to use is, First, we're going to formulate a performance bound exactly as we did in the previous part um, on this training distribution. And then if we, in practice, fail on new environments, that gives us evidence that our, our bound is violated and therefore we're out of distribution. So for example, if in practice, that hardware example I was showing, we failed on 15 out of 30 examples, that means the hardware was harder than the simulator in a meaningful way. And therefore, you know, we should consider it out of distribution. And there are two sort of key desired characteristics we want. With the setup, we want it to be task relevant. Meaning, again, like assume we have a tree that's 200 feet away that doesn't affect anything about our policy. So that's a task irrelevant change. We don't care about that shouldn't affect the, the, you know, the performance of the policy. And so we want to sort of ignore that sort of distribution shift. Um, and we also want to guarantee uh, the detection of added distribution. Um, so we want to make sure that our robot can be safe um, in a sort of uh, with some sort of notion of confidence. So we formalize this with two different approaches. And in this section, I'll sort of uh, go by go by uh, this slide quickly, just so that um, uh, it provides motivation for the, for the next couple projects. Um, so we use p-values um, and confidence intervals to sort of formalize this this intuition, where if we fail, you know, if our performance bound is violated, then we should expect to be out of distribution. Um, in p in the p-value case, we formulate an null hypothesis, which is that you know the test environments are not harder than the training environments, and if that's violated in practice, then then um, you know we can say that this is out of distribution, and also with confidence intervals. So we lower bound the difference between the expected cost of these two you know, training and testing environments. And if that lower bound is greater than zero, then we know that the testing environments are harder in, a, you know, in, in the sense of the cost. Um, and so the two detectors we can make are just, if the p-value drops below significant significance value, then we detect out of distribution. If the, delta, if the lower bound is positive, then we detect out of distribution. And so let me just show you what this looks like. We have um, a fan here, which you know, we haven't seen in training, this was again trained in simulation, and we know that the hardware should reasonably well match. But you know now there's this fan that we haven't seen before in training, and it's going to be able to blow winds up to five meters per second. Um, and the cost here is a uh, uh, proportional to the distance to the obstacle. So if we get really close to an obstacle, that's a higher cost. We stay sort of far away um, from the obstacle, that's better. And so this drone is going to be trying to avoid obstacles by the largest margin possible. And it's going to show you some some uh, videos of the drone 
So um, this is exactly what we we're trying to do in sort of demonstrating that there's a, a degradation of cost and we are able to detect that the you know, 100% wind environments are out of distribution meaningfully. Um, however, sort of the key challenge with this project and sort of motivation for the next projects is that the detection occurs after the rollout. We need to have seen the bad cost in order to you know, detect that we're out of distribution. And so let me just sort of illustrate why this is a problem with this environment. Okay, so we achieved a, a cost of zero. Let me play it again. So now we now we run a new environment. This is the same exact policy, you know, in just a different environment. I I've strategically placed occluded obstacles here so that the policy doesn't see them when it, when it starts. Up. Okay. okay, we failed again. Now finally we have enough ed evidence. This is out of distribution, except we've broken two drones potentially, right? So this is why this this sort of first project. Um, is really motivating, especially when the cost function is really informative. But if there is a potential failure case, you need to be able to do it online in order to actually ensure the safety of the robot in the first place. In the first place, so how do we how do we um, sort of ensure the the safety of this robot? One of the things we're going to assume <clears throat> is that this policy is black box, and this is a pretty reasonable assumption, especially for larger scale systems. We don't want to have to redesign the entire system. We just want to sort of tack on something a little bit extra to ensure the safety of the robot in potentially new um, environments. And sort of the key desired characteristics are similar to the first setting, except now we want to do this online and actually stop the robot before any sort of crash occurs. And we also want to bound both false positive and false negative rates, um, sort of more concretely. We want to bound errors um, uh, of the drone. Um, and so what we're going to be given is a, a black box policy, and we can test it in a series of environments, similarly um, to how we had in the first setting. But instead of getting an environment of you know, office spaces, we're going to get an data set of, of examples of the policy failing or succeeding environments. So for example, here's you know, the first example, the policy like the succeeding. Here's another example. Succeeds, and then in this one, the policy ends up. And so this could be sort of an arbitrarily good or bad policy. The point is that we're just trying to improve the safety. Um, and we don't actually know how well it's going to perform until we get this uh, data set. And so we're going to develop a failure predictor um, at, which uses a history of observation, so this first-person depth um, depth um, image from the perspective of the drone, and make a prediction about the future outcome. So this is what I mean by a failure predictor um, of the drone. So we take you know the past H depth sensor measurements and and just map them to a success or failure at some point in the future. I um, mean we're going to try to provide uh, you know a notion of confidence about whether or not this failure predictor is going to work in practice. Um, so we need a way to sort of classify the errors of the failure predictor, and we have two kinds of errors. There are false positives when the predictor was too conservative, meaning we said there was a failure, but there wasn't going to be a failure. The drone was going to succeed. And a false negative, meaning we missed you know, a failure and there was a potentially safety critical crash or something. Um, and so we, the cost function we use is just sort of a, a simple um, extrapolation from this, is we just use the, the sum of the rates of false positives and false negatives. So FNR is the false negative rate, and FPR is the false positive rate. And this cost is exactly the expected you know, uh, failure rate of our, of, our, of our predictor. And since, you know, if you'll recognize this, this uh, term here, it looks exactly like um, the pack base sort of term we've been trying to minimize. And we can do the same thing. We can provide the pack base bound directly onto this expected cost on future environments. And as before, we can bound this expected cost, this term, by a training cost plus a regularizer term. And so it looks exactly the same as sort of the other um, pack base bound we saw before, but just uh, on the failure predictor itself instead of the policy. And so we know that we can bound the total error of false positives and false negatives. However, there's sort of you know, a key challenge built into this, which is that these are equally weighted in our cost terms. But you know, for safety critical systems, a failure, you know, a crash, uh, for example, a false, a false negative would be much more costly than a false positive. It's potentially OK to stop the robot, not complete the, you know, the trajectory, as long as we don't crash a robot and potentially break something. And so um, yeah, there's, for safety critical applications, we don't think this is quite enough. Um, and we actually extended this method to independently limit the number of false negatives and false positives. And this is one of the sort of key uh, highlights of this approach. So the way we do this is by tuning the importance of different types of errors, exactly like, you, you know, in my intuition, crashing is much worse than just stopping and having to reset. 
Um, and so uh, we encode this with a parameter lambda, which we can scale between zero and one by, you know, just doing a linear combination. Uh, and uh, as you know, lambda gets closer to zero, then we care less and less about false positives. Um, and so we write this cost function, which um, so it turns out that since we only have a data set, we don't know the true false positive and false negative rates, so we have to use empirical um, estimates. And this causes a couple complications with providing the bound. But ultimately, again, I won't get too much into detail here. We're able to um, provide a pack based bound on this cost function by using an over approximation of it and, and therefore um, not running it into any statistical issues. And so the result is when we sweep lambda from zero to one, you know, changing the importance of false positives and false negatives is we get, you know, a wide variety of, of failure detectors, some which care much more about false negatives, so the ones on this side, and some which care much more about false positives, positives the one on this side. And so this red line here is actually showing the guarantee that we get on the on the like with high probability, the number of false positive, the excuse me, the false positive rate will be less than you know this value um, on this red line, which I think is really strong. And this blue line um, is showing the actual empirical performance. We just tested it a bunch of time in simulation, and we see that there's pretty close matching between the bound and the performance of the of the policy itself. Um, and so let's see how this sort of implements in hardware. We test on our sort of same hardware setup, and we have this balancing environment, and it turns out that actually in this so after the after we sort of run the rollout, and if the failure detector stops the policy, um, then we run it again without the failure detector to see if the policy would have succeeded. So we can actually get the true label of the environment. Although in practice, you you wouldn't test to see if your drone crashed. Um, in practice, so I'll just play this again. Um, you can see that the drone stopped just sort of that gap right there because we you know the, the policy thought we weren't going to or the failure detector thought we weren't going to make it through. So in this next case, we predict the failure, and they're actually looking to be in that green optical bubble to get it at the beginning of the cycle. Um, and then the next case where we predict success, and the policy is able to succeed and get through the entire cycle. And the last environment here, the one that I haven't shown, is the safety critical one, the one where the drone is going to is going to crash because we missed a failure. Um, and it turns out that actually it doesn't because in our videos of, of 30 runs. We had no crashes when we were using the failure detector. So we think this is a, a really great result. So we actually had no false negatives in hardware experiments, um, uh, which uh, you know validates the sort of ability of this to improve the safety of, of the drone. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the motivating for the next section is that we still have a key challenge here is that we need to see failures. So in order to distinguish between failures and successes, we need to have a data set of failures, potentially you know even 50 or 100 or even 10,000 failures if you need a really strong um, guarantee. And so in the next section, motivated by this, we're going to try to avoid this requirement. We want some sort of, you know, failure free calibration method in order to still perform well. And the sort of approach we take um, is by, well, we're going to switch settings, but we're going to provide a, a detector for uh, prediction failures. And so we switch to the autonomous vehicle setting because we're going to be able to take advantage of the many modules built into autonomous vehicles. So there are a few sort of key modules that I just want to mention to make this, uh, this example much more clear. Um, so that in uh, autonomous driving, there is usually a perception system which tells you, you know, where other agents are and, and what other agents are doing. Um, and then there's a prediction system which, based on that information, makes a prediction about what we think other agents are going to be doing. So, for example, this black car is some other agent and it's moving forward in the lane and we think it's going to keep moving forward in the lane. And let's say this green vehicle is our ego or our uh, autonomous vehicle that we're trying to control. Um, and then the, the next system uses all that information and tries to make a plan that's safe and achieves your goal of getting you know, to the end point or dropping off the passengers or whatever um, whatever your goal is. Um, and we see that what actually happens with this black car, our prediction was to go straight, it turns into our lane. And so this would be an example of a failure for the prediction system that affects you know, the planner of our system. It's affecting the downstream um, planning. And so the sort of key desired characteristics we want for this uh, prediction failure detector is we don't want to see failures. We want this to work just sort of in practice um, uh, as motivated by the previous section. We also still want this to be task relevant. As the other uh, as the other parts of of, uh, of my talk. So, for example, if the the car actually turns away from us, goes into a lane further away, there's still a prediction error. The prediction was not correct, but we don't you know it's not affecting our plan. Just as like a tree far away is not affecting our plan if it was mis uh, mislabeled. Um, and so we don't want to actually detect these. This is useful to keep note of if you want to like retrain your prediction module. But you don't want to stop the car or take an emergency maneuver if this car just turns away from you when you were expecting it to go straight. Um, we want this to happen in real time so that we can actually improve the safety of the, of the car, just as like the online failure detector, uh, failure predictor. And we want to provide a notion of confidence, just as in the previous section, so that we can meaningfully say that we're improving the safety of the system. 
And the way that we sort of go about this is by reasoning about um, the effect of prediction errors on the downstream planning module. So this, the, you know, the prediction was to go straight and as it turns in, we see that that is a negatively affecting the planning cost or would negatively affect the planning cost. And that's how we're gonna sort of reason about how to do this. And so just bear with me, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of notation to make this uh, uh, more formal. So we have an observed cost and we're no longer using a cost on you know, a whole policy. This is sort of an instantaneous, more classical co cost, you know, given the state and control at input. Um, and this is just gonna be what the, the, you know, the R agent sees given other agent positions um, as, as the cost according to its planner. So for example, if agents are really close to us, there'll be a higher cost. If agents are far away and we're going, you know, achieving our, our goal, um, the cost would be lower. There's also gonna be, you know, the prediction module will provide uh, predicted states of other agents. So we're gonna use uh, X hat to note this. So for, you know, tau time steps in the future, for, you know, four time steps in the future, we make predictions about what other agents are gonna be doing in the environment. We also have a predicted cost, which is using, you know, our plan trajectory and the other agents predicted locations, we can actually compute sort of a predicted cost, which we're just gonna call a C hat, which just depends on what we think everybody's gonna be doing and where we are. And uh, what we actually want our prediction or, or frequently what a, a prediction modules output is a distribution over future agent trajectories. And this is really useful because you want to capture uncertainty about what other agents are going to be doing um, and also sort of capture a wide variety of potential paths. So saying that we know for a fact the agent will go straight when they're in a turn lane and a straight lane is probably not a great idea because it may be unknowable um, if they're going to turn or not. And so we're going to uh, capture this by just uh, requiring a distribution over predicted states. And this distribution over predicted states is going to induce a distribution over predicted costs. Um, and the sort of uh, quantifying the, uh, the intuition that I provided on the last slide is we're going to be comparing this observed cost, the planning cost, with the, you know, our predictions about what the cost was going to be um, at, this, at this time step um, in the future. And so we formalize this with trying to detect peak quantile anomalies, which I'll, I'll first just say in words, and then I'll show a picture that hopefully will make it um, clear. So if an observed cost, this cost as we roll out the, the environment, as we achieve the trajectory, um, lies within the top P quantile, so the top tail of the predicted cost distribution, we're going to call this the P quantile anomaly. And so to make this concrete, so let's say this red car is our, our ego vehicle, and this white line trajectory is what actually happens in the environment. So this is what the other agent's actually going to do. But in reality, or, or our predictions of this other agent are these black dots and these blue contour plots. So this is just a Gaussian matrix model of what we think the other agent is going to be doing at each of these time steps. <clears throat> and using our cost function, we can map this distribution to some distribution over costs. Um, and what happens as we roll out this trajectory for you know these four time steps, if in practice, you know the the predict the observed cost is really high. Know, towards the top end of this tail, then it's much worse than we had predicted the cost should have been. And that's an indication of a P quantile anomaly where P is the top P proportion of this environment, of this uh, cost distribution. Okay, so how do we actually detect this and how do we how do we use this to sort of improve the safety? Um, we can't compute this distribution over costs directly because it relies on you know, a planning cost for autonomous vehicle, which may be nonlinear or you know, computed even with a neural network. Um, so it's not clear exactly how to um, get this cost. So we're get, what we can do is we can sample um, from this cost. Excuse me. So we're going to sample m times from this distribution over costs, and we're going to make a data set out of that distribution. Um, we're just calling this S of t plus tau. So at tau time steps in the future, we have a data set of sampled costs. And um, also frequently in autonomous vehicles, you actually use this data set to make the plan about the environment in the first place. And so frequently, you're not requiring extra computation um, to get this data set of, of sampled costs. And our detection is that when our observed cost is really high compared to this data set, um, that we're in a, you know, M minus N high rank um, of our data set that we're going to call this a detection. So when our, when the rank is really high, that means we're higher than a majority of the costs that we have sampled. And therefore that provides evidence that we're a P quantile anomaly. And so we can actually use just this notion of a detection to bound the false positive and false negative rate of this detector. So if we, if we're, we have a detection and there is no anomaly, that would be an example of a false positive. Um, and we can exactly bound that just by using sort of standard statistical methods, which I won't get um, into here. And, and similarly with false negatives. So if there, we have no detection, but there is actually an anomaly, um, we can similarly bound the rate of false negatives. So how do we use this in practice? We can pick an N, you know, uh, the rank that we need to be higher than, um, 
And then for each time step, if we're higher than that rank and we get a detection, then we can say the whole you know, trajectory is anomalous. And we can tune the sort of sensitivity of our detector by changing this value n and the you know, quantile that we care about. In, in this work, we use p is 0.05, so the top 5% of the quantile of the, um, the cost distribution. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, introduce the way that we uh, actually test this. Um, the trajectory predictor that we use um, is trajectron plus plus. This is just sort of a outputs Gaussian mixture models for other agents' trajectories in the future. And we're going to be testing on, um, or the planner that we use is generated, uh, uh, generates a motion primitive tree and then selects sort of the motion primitive that has the best uh, cost outcome. Um, and the data set we use is uh, from new plan, which is uh, driving scenarios with reactive agents. Um, and just to show you what a couple examples might look like. So here, the red agents are, are non-ego agents and the blue agent is our, our vehicle. And you can see in the circled image, there are two agents. So the red lines are what actually is gonna happen in the black and the blue contour lines are, are sort of predictions about what, a, what other agents are gonna do. And you can see that we predict that these other agents are gonna sort of veer into our lane, but in reality, they end up going straight. And so this is an example of a task irrelevant shift. So we, we thought they were gonna sort of veer into our lane, but they ended up going straight and everything you know, should be okay. And similarly, in this example, um, you can see the black contour plot here stop short. So that's the predictions think that the other agents are going to stop, but in reality, they go forward right into our ego vehicle. And what's really, I guess, both good and bad about this new plan is the reactive agents are not very good drivers, which is good because you get interesting scenarios, but also bad because then you get you know images that look like this where every car is crashing into each other, which is, of course, not realistic, but we're just trying to sort of demonstrate um, the approach. So we... Um, we call our method the quantile anomaly detector, and we compare it with a number of other methods that sort of are trying to do the same thing, trying to detect when there's a degradation of performance in a sort of meaningful way. So uh, two other methods um, we compare to are the uniform and partial degradation test, which I won't get to, uh, into too much because I think some of those methods maybe illustrate the, the, um, the performance better. Um, we also uh, compare to Hamilton Jacobi reachability. So this is when we sort of assume worst case behavior of another agent and check if they're able to collide with us. And if they're able to collide with us, then that's a detection and we're in sort of an unsafe scenario. We also use a time to collision metric, which is sort of a standard autonomous car cost function. So you assume at a given time step, every car is just continuing its forward velocity in a line. And if you know the lowest time to collision between you and another agent is below a second, that means you're very close to a crash, even if you can physically avoid it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then we test with a couple other methods, which again, just for the purpose of time, I won't get into. And so the way that we generate this plot um, for our method and other methods is these all have tuning parameters. So in our case, it's the P quantile that we care about 0.05, and then this, this factor N, which can go up and down um, depending on how, you know, uh, how a strong we want our false negative and false positive rate guarantee to be. Um, so as we sweep through this, you know, uh, up and down, we get similar to the, uh, the failure prediction, we get a, a, a range of, of uh, uh, failure predictors or failure detectors, um, and, and same with other methods. So in the likelihood, excuse me, in the time to collision um, method, as the time to collision threshold threshold increases, so let's say we only care about when the time to collision is less than three seconds versus one second. The one second is less sensitive to um, anomalies. And the first plot here I'm just showing is to, we compute the area under this curve, and we just show that our method does provide um, the best area under the curve. But in the second method, and again, something that I didn't mention in the last slide, um, was that we want this to be happening in a data-free way, right? So what I've what I've drawn here is, uh, you know, the true uh, positive rate and the false positive rate. We need to actually have labels in order to do that in the first place. And so this is using a data set. Um, but if we didn't have a data set, we do still have a data-free calibration method. And that's exactly what the guarantee we have on the false positive and the false negative rate. And so when we just use our guarantee on the false positive rate, we it sort of automatically picks N, that, uh, the, the scaling perimeter for our method. And there are a couple other... Um, methods that have a, a built-in uh, uh, data-free method, such as, such as HD reachability, where, you know, if the, if the le uh, zero level set is negative, then another car can crash into you, and that's the detection. Um, and so for our two methods, when we both, when we guarantee the false positive rate, or we guarantee the false negative rate, we get two different detectors, which are plotted here, the, the red triangle and the, and the, the red circle. Um, and ultimately, we see that the performance is quite good in the data-free method. So of course, you can improve the, the method if you do see failures and know exactly what an anomaly should look like. But ultimately, we're trying to demonstrate that we still can um, do this without, uh, without uh, data uh, fail examples of failures. And so I'll show a more qualitative analysis of, of this, uh, this uh, failure predictor. 
Um, so we test in, in both new plan and new scenes. These are also just uh, uh, driving scenarios. Um, and we just test in what's called the log playback scenario. So we just let everybody drive. This is exactly as recorded um, on the vehicle. So there's no planning. And we compare the scenes that we detect as anomalous with other you know, methods as anomalous. And so this in this first example, here's our, you know, the red vehicle is, is the ego. And there are two pedestrians right next to the car that are predicted actually to move away from the car. And um, all methods are detecting this as anomalous. This is maybe like people getting in or out of the car, which is definitely not something, a normal cost function, not the one that we wrote anyway would account for. We're not accounting for uh, you know, uh, a different cost function in different scenarios. And so all methods are detecting this as anomalous because the agents are so close to the car that anything moving would be very bad. Another example um, is where this car is passing through you know, a crosswalk and these these agent, these green pedestrians have their trajectories sort of moving into the crosswalk. And this agent in particular, we predict as staying exactly still, but actually it's moving towards the car. Um, and so this is a, 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 what I would call an example of a task relevant prediction error. We predicted the pedestrian should go straight, but actually they're getting quite close to the car. And I, I think end up within like five centimeters of the car in the actual you know, recorded environment, which I think is definitely something that would be important to uh, uh, record. So another, uh, I think, illustrative example is here too, you know, our, our agent and uh, another agent just driving on sort of a highway together, and our predictions are pretty accurate, but HD reachability says that this, this agent is anomalous and that it could crash into us. Um, but ultimately, in sort of normal driving scenarios, there are many cars that could crash into you. We don't always want to be, you know, overly sensitive to those examples. And then similarly, in the, in the last example, we see that the predictions are not super correct, but it does get the, the sense of the right trajectory. Um, and the HDA reachability um, still detects as, as anomalous. So to sort of summarize this section, <clears throat> um, in the first part, we leverage violations of uh, pack bays bounds to uh, detect out of distribution settings when we were encountering scenarios that violated um, the pack bays. Um, and so we used uh, detectors based on p-value and confidence intervals um, when we had sort of introduced wind in our, in our test environments. In the sort of second part of this section, we developed an online failure predictor, which uh, didn't need to see the crash beforehand. And we can limit both the false positive and false negative rate um, by sort of scaling the importance of that in a cost function. And we were able to meaningfully improve the state of the drug. It's overlaid, you know, the one with uh, the crash and the one with the failure detector, which is stopping the crash from occurring. And in the most recent section, we developed a task relevant detector for prediction errors. Um, and we were still able to limit the false negative and false positive rate, uh, false, false positive rate. And we didn't actually need to see failures in order to at least have some reasonable performance um, on this setting. Okay, so this is all great. Um, we don't, however, we don't just want to detect issues with or distribution shifts. We actually just want to perform well in the first place, which is sort of the more like more root uh, problem, but ultimately a more complex and, and difficult problem in general. Um, and so this sort of brings me to the next the next part of my talk, um, where I'll sort of just give a summary of, of what I did here and then sort of motivate uh, future work. So what we're trying to do in this section is not just you know detect things, but actually just work well. So for example, when you have different lighting conditions, you would think, sorry, you would think that you change the lighting conditions by two percent, all the pixel values are different, but you should still think you would want your robot to still perform well. But in practice, even just a slight lighting change could cause a catastrophic failure. And so this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, so in the background, um, at the very beginning of the talk, what we what we did is given a training data set of environments drawn from you know some unknown distribution over over office spaces. You know, we train in there and then we test and using just standard pack based generalization coming straight from supervised learning, we're able to get a guarantee on the setting. And so the first extension we make to this is by uh, generalization to shifted distributions. And by shifted, um, I mean that the difference between this distribution here, which is just a, you know, a different office space setting distribution and this distribution, the test one, which is the same as the training distributions has to be bounded in terms of the kale divergence. Um, and so I won't get too much into detail what that means, but it's just a way of measuring the difference between two distributions. Um, and unfortunately, the kale divergence is very easy to be infinite, or it's really difficult to make small. Um, and so in practice, this is a, only works in very particular scenarios. And the other challenge here is that you actually need to know what the distribution is in order to bound the kale divergence. So if someone just gives me a new environment, I don't know if that environment has a bounded kale divergence with respect to what I was training with. And so this is one of the key challenges here to sort of get away with needing to know exactly what the distributions are like, um, we switched to the meta learning setting. Um, and so in this case, we're gonna train on not just a single uh, type of setting, but many, you know, a series of office spaces. And this allows us to leverage a different sort of generalization bound um, called algorithmic stability, which I talked about in the related work very briefly, um, such that when we are given a new sort of context, and it, if we give a little bit of time to adapt for one example of that environment, then we can perform well in future environments and sort of a, 
a strong sense. Uh, we have a guarantee about performing well. Um, but again, this is sort of a specific notion. You need a lot of these training, you know, contexts, which may be hard to obtain in practice. Um, and again, it's difficult to uh, know for a fact that your um, your you know, let's say, residential spaces are coming from um, like are contextually the same as the other spaces that you've been training in. And so. Um, I guess the question I sort of the reason I'm talking about it in this way is because I want to sort of pose the question of how do we broaden settings um, for feasible out of distribution detection or how do we get towards more broad out of distribution generalization. So these, I mean, these settings are are much stronger if we can achieve them, but ultimately they're difficult to achieve in practice. It's a little bit easier to make a failure detector improve the safety of your robot because you know that it's a you know it's a problem is I think somewhat easier. So um, how do we get uh, broader generalization guarantees? And so I'll talk a little bit about this, this project that I did with, uh, with an undergrad, which is trying to compare the complexity of a robotic task. And then using this notion, we'll be able to provide strong notions of guarantees um, in new settings. So for example, give, you know, take this middle example as, as some task that we know how to do. For example, navigate an office space. Now we flip it around the y-axis. So like just you know, you know, in, a, in a meaningful way, like all the sensor measurements are flipped and things like that or we change the lighting by a little bit. You would think that if we could do this middle one, we should be able to do one of the other ones, maybe with a different policy, but we should still be able to do it because it doesn't seem any more difficult or less difficult. And so we introduced this notion of a reduction between robotic tasks, which draws very heavily from the computational complexity notion of a reduction in computer science. So we try to use a policy for task two, let's just say this is task two, the middle one, to solve or as a subroutine to solve task one, which is, I guess, one of the outside tasks. So if we know how to solve this one, can we use that as a subroutine to solve the, the uh, uh, task one? And so for example, uh, or I guess specifically how we do this is we provide an encoder and a decoder um, on the policy. So for this encoder encodes sensor inputs and then gives it to the policy for task two. And then the decoder takes those actions for task two and outputs them as actions for task one. Um, and so for example, you know, I, I can, describe the reduction between these two environments where we flip around the y-axis, you flip all the sensor measurements, and then when you, you, know, you get the output, you just cross the wires of the motors, or instead of turning left, you turn right. Um, and so we can exactly you know, prove that there's a reduction between these two environments if you can solve um, this, this center task here. Um, so this provides like a zero one notion of reduction. Either you reduce between tasks or you don't. Um, but we also wanted to introduce sort of a more continuous scale of reduction, and we call this relative complexity which just sort of shows how close we are to redu reducing between the task. And it just scales uh, by the maximum reward that we can achieve on one task um, minus the sort of uh, encoded using the known policy decoded um, from, the, from the other task. Um, and I guess sort of making this more concrete, how can we actually use these to uh, improve generalization bounds? And uh, I guess also, you know, once we do have a better understanding of complexity, can we, you know, further, um, uh, improve generalization bounds. So actually, just uh, as an example, at the end of my thesis, I wrote, if we you know, do have this notion of reduction and we do know an encoder and a decoder, we can actually write a new generalization bound that directly maps between these two tasks where we don't have to know anything about the distribution or anything like that. We just have to know there is a reduction between the two tasks. So it, <clears throat> exactly like we have our reductions or our pack-based bounds before, we're bounding the expected performance of any new environment coming from task one by the empirical performance of now uh, the, of task two instead of task one plus a regularizer term as we did before. Um, and so I think this is a really, you know, potentially exciting way to uh, broaden the, the notions of generalization um, that we had before. Um, so another sort of direction for future work, I think um, could be trying to achieve stronger guarantees and detection. So I guess the, I haven't talked too much about the numbers because I think it's, um, it's um, not as impressive as it should be, partially because, so I guess the number I showed at the beginning of the talk was we can guarantee uh, that we'll succeed in 93% of new environments. So for a drone in a lab setting, I think that's very strong, but for an autonomous car on a road, 93% is like, we wouldn't make it hundred feet basically. So it's really, I think, important to try to work towards a stronger generalization. Um, and so how can we actually get to stronger um, bounds such that they're you know, strong enough for safety critical applications? Um, I think one potential approach is to try to use or leverage conformal prediction, which I talked about in the related work. And so I guess just to provide some background, the, um, the sample complexity of this regularizer, this R term here that I haven't been writing out, um, in terms of the number of samples that we get to train, goes as one over the square root of N. So it, it can be somewhat weak, even with like 10,000 environments, you know, one over the square root of N is only point, uh, 0.01 or something. So 1%, you know, uh, can be um, very loosening. But it has a really nice, strong uh, sampling guarantee. It, it holds uniformly over 
over the sample of, of, of a data set that you received. So that S data set we received at Office Spaces, we train our policy. And now for any, any policy we train on that data set, we'll always provide this guarantee. Um, and um, that's what I mean by a sort of a strong assumption. In conformal prediction, the, the regularizer term depends as one over n. So it's much better in that sense, but it, it only holds uniformly over a sampling S and a synthesis of your policy. So basically, for every new environment, you have to resynthesize your policy in order for the guarantee to hold, which is both expensive but also difficult to achieve in practice. Um, but I think that there are some potential combinations of these two approaches which could provide you know, better sample complexity, um, but still providing um, strong guarantees. So another sort of approach for future uh, work, I think, is motivated by this video. So if we look at this, what this car is doing, this person sort of just suddenly play again, turns into our lane, and you can see the driver of this car you know, slows down quickly, but even like looks over in the next lane, like maybe I can go into that, that next lane. Um, and I guess one of the challenges here, um, or one of the challenges with the method, methods that I provided is you don't have a strong sense of what to do once there is an anomaly. And if like your prediction work, I just sort of stopped the drone because I knew as the designer that stopping the drone would keep it safe. But in an autonomous car, this is not clear at all. Actually stopping can be sometimes worse than going faster or things like that. And so trying to understand why there was a detection can pro potentially provide a causal reason um, for like what to do after the detection has occurred in the first place. Um, another, I think, exciting direction for future work is trying to bound um, risk instead of the sort of expected performance or the worst case performance. So I guess the, the safety certificates I've been giving um, in this work are expected certificates. So with, high, you know, 95% of the time we'll succeed or, or, and things like this. But um, for Hamilton Jacoby reachability or H infinity control, there are worst case scenarios. So at all times we'll um, be safe, but given these, you know, particular assumptions. Um, and however, worst case uh, guarantees also tend to be really conservative and limit the sort of ability of your controllers. Um, and so I think bounding a risk metric, which is essentially in between the worst case and the expected value, um, could, could provide an exciting middle ground um, that improves um, these sorts of bounds. And sort of the last thing I want to um, mention is that all of these you know, models and uh, methods that I've developed cost a lot of computation time and therefore energy and you know, is not the great, great for the environment. So I think it's also worth exploring um, approaches to not only train better, but also make the systems work better. So this this particular paper called Train Faster, Generalize Better, um, it shows that if you actually train your model more effectively, they tend to generalize better. We actually use this notion to provide one of the generalization bounds for out of diffusion detection. That's the meta-learning one that I just glossed over. <clears throat> but this notion, I think, provides motivation for other ways that we could both train, train faster, reduce energy costs, and then still uh, perform better. Um, okay, so that's the end of my talk. I just need a couple of minutes to thank um, some important um, people, if you'll just bear with me for another few minutes. Um, yeah, of course, this this PhD wouldn't have been possible without like many people that have helped me along the way, um, specifically Ani, um, who's not only impacted the research and the work, but also my graduate career. Um, so actually, I wrote about the first, or I'm going to talk about the first meeting that we had over Skype 2, because I had a very specific memory from it too, which was that one of the first questions you asked me was what I wanted to work on or what I thought was exciting based on some of the stuff that I had read um, in your work. And I was like, oh, I think, you know, machine learning, it's cool. You know, little did I know. Um, and you, I, I said like a couple of things. And then the next thing you said were like five ideas that you had about that particular, you know, line of work. And so I think that not only your ability to let me direct myself in terms of my research, but also come up with really exciting ideas related to those particular directions, I think has been not only inspiration, but really helpful um, to my work um, in this PhD. Um, and yeah, also Ani has been like extremely patient with me as I like figured out the right way to work, especially like over COVID when, you know, I was working like three feet from my bed. So it's like hard to be effective. But, you know, as I was like working through different ways of like meeting and like keeping track of my work, Ani was like very patient. And so I really, really appreciate both the support in terms of my working style, but also um, PhD overall. Um, so Marco was, I'm not sure if he's on, but Marco was my um, mentor during NVIDIA internship. And he has this incredible ability to like drill down and and explain it or like ask the question that you didn't want asked because you like didn't know how to answer it. And so if you like present something, he'll like ask this question and you're like, I wish I knew how to answer that. And so I think this really helped um, make the NVIDIA work that I did there um, much more impressive and um, his ability to sort of um, come up with these really interesting problems was really helpful for this. Um, I also want to thank um, Naomi. Um, for both being on my PhD committee and reading my thesis sort of last minute. Um, and you also have this ability to like ask the, I guess your perspective from the controls background really makes me question 
the you know the machine learning approach that I have. And so I know that when I've convinced you of something, that the idea is like significantly stronger than it was if I if you were skeptical about it. And so I really appreciate um, your perspective um, there. And also, Tom, I wanted to thank uh, who's also been on <clears throat> excuse me, who's also been on my committee and provides actually a machine learning, like a more machine learning perspective than we had, especially at the beginning of my PhD when not really anybody in our group had done a ton of machine learning. And so it was really helpful to get his feedback both on papers and what you know sort of the community in, in machine learning would be excited about. And you've definitely helped me make my idea sort of more broadly appealing to uh, to communities. And um, also Jaime, I wanted to thank who is a reader. I also don't think she's here, but he was a reader for my thesis very last minute. So I, I really appreciate um, his time in doing that. And also his course, um, on safety critical robotic systems really helped me get the foundation of like other approaches to safety as opposed to pack based from generalization, which is really helpful for sort of understanding why my method might work and might not work in in other cases. Um, so this work that I presented is definitely not possible without my collaborators, especially Sashant, who has been a co author on many of the papers that I presented here, a co first author on many of the papers um, and helped me sort of develop these detection methods. I um, mean, also sort of served as a mentor early in my PhD career, so I really appreciate that. Um, David also, who is a co-author on the failure prediction um, method, has been my office mate, like sits next to me, um, has tolerated me asking like random questions about not only like writing, but also like random math things. So I really appreciate that as well. And Michelle, who's an undergrad applying to um, applying to grad school right now, worked on the complexity theory paper, um, both very impressive. And also I really appreciate working with her um, on that. And I'll just briefly mention the other collaborators, but they've been like immensely helpful to the research here. Um, so Alan, Divi, um, Boris, Karen, Anoop, and then of course the, the advisors, Ani and uh, Ani and Marco. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate all of the contributions, both to the research, but also the mentorship and um, collaborative nature of all these work. Um, so I also, I have to mention IROM Lab and sort of our humble beginnings of me, Vince and Megan at the first, our first ever ICRA. Um, you know, it was winter themed, which is why this picture looks silly. Um, <laughs> to growing into sort of a many undergraduates, many graduate students, group both over Zoom, you know, at, at the Witherspoon Grill, at the Tap House, where all the famous people from Princeton have their pictures, and also at conferences. And so, yeah, I guess the, the first picture where there are three of us, this was the last row where there's a whole bunch of us. We might have even missed someone in this picture, I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, I guess the the being part of the group has been such a wonderful experience. Um, having coffee time every day where we can just sort of chat, both about research projects, but also about like other things that are going on. Um, and um, both in terms of research, but also in terms of friendship in the IROM lab and also outside of IROM lab. So for example, this is us watching the FIFA game instead of, well, we were kind of working, but we were also watching the FIFA game um, a few weeks ago. Um, and I guess I wanted to thank both the friends and family in IROM lab and in the cohort and in the prison community, but also people outside of the, of the community as well, including the animals here. They're all very important. I actually wasn't on this canoe trip, but I thought like, you that's the kind of activity we do and I couldn't find a picture of any of the other IROM lab activities so it's just showing as an example even though I'm not actually in that picture um, and then especially early on in my graduate career like having these social events I think was really significant towards my you know I guess feeling like a part of the department and feeling the, like a part of the lab this is at like I don't know what's called it's a trampoline place where everybody like jumps around on the trampoline um, and this is us go-karting that's why we have the silly hats on and then again I, I just want to um, specifically thank my parents and my brother and his fiance and my girlfriend Claire for being so supportive of me throughout this entire process. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll just thank the many sources of funding and, and like NVIDIA for the internship. Um, and with that, I'll leave a research overview and uh, take any questions. All right, I think the, the format three, three people as well as we take uh, questions from the general audience first, uh, and then questions from the interview. Uh, I guess my understanding is in our department, everything is all the questions and discussion are public. Uh, there's no kind of separate uh, session of questions. We just have a few minutes for the committee to tell one question, but then I think that's why they will not. So, yeah, the first uh, questions from the general audience and then questions from the committee. Also, people on Zoom can either write or unmute themselves if they, they want. Sorry, my voice is getting hoarse. I know it's good. Yeah. Yeah. 
section in different parts of the problem settings, um, which are used to as part of the unit to be sort of like the idea. And like a simple adjustment could be we can get part of the process to be scanned. Yep. The same thing for I do. Yeah, I think that's that's actually a great point. And also, I mean, I think there are cases, maybe you did mention it enough, there are cases where HD reachability and H infinity control are really powerful, especially when we have a strong understanding of the dynamics. And so I think, yeah, I think that's a good point. There are definitely ways, I think there, there I, I mean, I haven't thought of any, but I'm sure there are ways to sort of combine notions of our understanding about the, the dynamics and what can happen to the to the vehicle or, or airplane, um, ensuring safety or even reducing the, the um, Sort of conservativeness of some some of the HD reachability approaches. If we know that our car is going to stay, you know, within a certain range of acceleration and deceleration, we can potentially improve um, those sorts of those sorts of guarantees. Yeah. So in the case where you had a you know, configuration where obstacle consistent, right? Um, in the case of where it failed, do you think that the diameter of of like the poles, like if, if they were like different, then you would see like a different result. Because I, I could imagine that what your robot would see would be like some kind of like curate. Yeah. So, yeah. So the way it maneuvers around that would also determine like all the what, what the size of that obstacle is. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great point, actually. And so I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess what maybe your, your, uh, another example of what you're alluding to is just any distribution shape. So let's say we have square obstacles or crescent shapes obstacles yeah. or you know, I mean, any other number of obstacles, I think, yeah, being able to deal with, I mean, it's still the same problem of obstacle avoidance, and we should be able to do well if there's a path, but, you know, learning-based systems have a really hard time generalizing to new systems, and so exactly the, the type of change you're trying to, you describe is exactly the type of thing we're trying to detect and generalize to, and so it, it certainly would affect the performance um, of, the, of the drone if you change even something as simple as that, yeah. Um, oh, so I have a question oh. in the chat. Um, okay, the notion of reducibility from CS is quite strong in the case of environment. Is there a weaker notion of task complexity that you could use? This is a, this is a great question, Jared. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess part yeah part of the motivation. I guess I'm using this as sort of a, a motivating um, example for future. Actually, the bound that I show here. Um, has a lot of caveats that I talk about in the thesis that I won't get into here. Um, and it's because of the sort of strong notion of reduction that we require. And, you know, there's a, there's like a one in one out requirement. So like every time step from one task has to correspond to every time step in another task. And this is you know not super easy to overcome with this particular um, notion. And so I think, yeah, I think that goes maybe towards trying to understand more, uh, more broadly, the, the difficulty of robotic tasks. And if you did have a better understanding, then I think, um, you would have a better understanding of how to leverage that for for reduction, um, or for for uh, generalization. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So I guess I um, maybe just make sure I understand your question. If M is really small, if we are unable to sample a lot, then essentially the thing that it changes is how strong our false positive and false negative rate guarantees are. And you're you're absolutely right. Actually, so in, in the example that we gave, M is only a hundred, which is pretty, you know, not not very unreasonable to compute. And actually the planners tend to use thousands um, in some cases. And so um, it's certainly, you know, the detection itself takes about like less than a millisecond to compute. The sampling takes less than a millisecond. And so even with like a thousand, you'd still be able to run this in real time. Um, so I guess in this particular setting, since we're trying to work on this prediction module that's only running at 10 Hertz or, or whatever the prediction module is running at, um, we're able to provide sort of strong notions, but you're right that in the, you know, if we can't sample very much or it's really expensive to sample, then this would become a challenge for the approach. Yeah, I mean, you might have to, like, like if you think about the yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Actually, another thing that we thought of, it, not quite similar, but um, would also address the problem is that we have multiple time steps. And so if in one time step you have a detection, but the next one you don't, is that a detection? 
in this in this case we're calling it a detection but we could also you know if we're not super confident then we could build up a notion just over a series of time steps to build up um, evidence of a detection um, so that also tries to address the, the same thing we i think we wrote the bounds but didn't end up um, using them because um, this was sort of simpler to state and test yeah um you, you talked a lot about uh, safety guarantees I wonder if you can turn that around in a way by possibility guarantees, right? So in particular, like you don't have a address or something like that, you should be able to say, you know, there exist environments such that if your goal is to achieve this level of safety, it's not really possible to do that. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, so yeah, I guess I don't, I have maybe like one thing to point out about uh, this particular, so we can do peak quantile anomaly detection. We can also do the opposite. We can do the, you know, the negative or, or the, the, you know, a Q, Q quantile where it's the bottom, you know, 0.05%. And actually in all of the methods that we've talked about task relevance, we have an equivalent notion of task irrelevance or an equivalent lower bound on the pack based bound. And so um, we could, yeah, I guess, in not all cases is that useful. So I'm not sure, for example, in this case, I'm not sure how much the lower quantile is useful just except for detecting when, you're, when your predictor is very wrong. But in, in other cases, such as, um, I guess, uh, like this first example that I showed, if we had an upper bound, we should say, we, we should know the maximum performance, or sorry, the minimum performance of the, of the policy. And if that's very low, then that gives us indication that we won't um, do well um, in practice. So yeah, th uh, there's, that's absolutely um, useful in practice. I don't talk about it. Um, in this in this paper, but we do on some of the um, on some of the papers that we published, we sort of show the other side or the other end of the bound, which ends up being useful. Well, yeah, I think. Well, I'm I'm not sure. I I, I guess I don't know anything about how autonomous cars work. Everything's behind NDAs and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think it's certainly I think it's certainly interesting. I think the way that companies sort of get around it is by just defining their operating domain. So for example, a lot of companies just refuse to work when there's a lot of construction or like when that person's holding a stop sign and then like puts it down, but there's, you can still see the stop sign. Humans know like exactly what that is. And I think it's still challenging for autonomous. I mean, maybe, maybe it is working, but that's my intuition at least. Um, and so there, so basically by knowing when you're, you're frequently failing in, in experiments, like in testing, then they can just sort of block off those regions um, in practice. But um, it would be interesting to also try to do that with bounds. Cool. A couple of questions. I already asked a bunch. Yeah. But, um, so one is, I really like that you have kind of a clear set of styles like meaningless and positive false and negatives. To me, this is kind of related to the capital M. Is there a way to, I mean, they have this ability to choose that balance, but how do you choose it? And what if you, is it possible to like learn as you go and seeing that, especially if something changes in the environment, you might want to change that balance as you go? Yeah, that's a Think about like my car. All the safety features, they always fail when you bring in the snow in the yeah. cloudy. And so, like, um, you might want to, and if you're, I don't, of course, you can choose bounds as you get more samples, yeah. or uh, or bounds start to not be so great because you change the way you use yeah, that's a it's a really great point. And so yeah, I think I, I you I think you make a great point is that sometimes like what we would want the threshold to be should would change in practice. I mean, you know, maybe we have a big data set of failures and, and positive cases or things like that, and we can tune, but then you know, we enter a new city and it's or Seattle where everything's raining frequently and then and this sort of thing changes. And so yeah, I think um sort of an online a learning approach could definitely be possible to sort of uh, try to address that. I guess one of the, the key challenges um with just doing online learning sort of straight away is that the bound actually holds for a particular distribution over you know failure detectors or particular policy and so not as directly as just like adapting and then recomputing the bound you would have to sort of make a online adaptation bound um, as you accrue data but your policy is now changing i'm actually i i imagine things uh, like a guarantee with uh, algorithmic stability so basically the sensitive sensitivity to your training data would um, would be able to provide some sort of bound so if you're if you're very uniformly stable, your algorithm is not very sensitive to training data, like uh, or like a ran the randomization of your training data. Um, and I think you can get some online sorts of guarantees uh, by using that. Maybe just another kind of open-ended question about 
like you know the video at the beginning was much more complex than um, static, you know, saying yeah. And, uh, so I just can imagine that in this sort of like a dynamic environment, and the environment changes in response to what your the robots doing. Yeah. And lots of other things that they hear of it in the setting. Yeah. Um, you know, really, really hard. So I wonder if uh, there are opportunities to, you know, like the record, something that you might know about what like, they hear at a stressful or something like that inside of you. Yeah, that actually that's a really good point, and I I guess um I didn't mention this here. So yeah, I mean I guess sort of the key challenge, another key challenge with pack bays. Um, let me just find the slide here. Um, yeah, the, uh, one of the key challenges with pack bays is is also this expectation, which I think is sort of related or, or maybe a similar challenge um, when you're operating in the in the environment. Um, there are things at the tail of the distribution or things you weren't expecting. And that's exactly, I mean, actually like dealing with the tail is basically all autonomous car companies are doing because all the like normal boring highway driving is actually kind of easy. Um, and so I think exactly what you're saying is trying to find maybe a middle ground between some sort of worst case or, you know, a reachability based approach and this sort of expected performance. And I think actually there, there is a way to, or I think there's some work that talks about trying to bound risk um, in, in these sorts of like dynamic and interchanging environments. Uh, one of the challenges with using pack bays directly for this is you require um, like some uniform sampling um, thing. So you have to sample uniformly from the, your distribution. And if you're interacting with the environment, it causes like a little bit of um, complications with that. And actually um, uh, conformal prediction has a, a better, uh, less re restrictive assumption about sampling is you only need uh, what's called interchangeability. So, you know, if you're just as likely to see one sequence of data as you are to see another sequence of data. And I think it would allow for interactive dynamics um, to use conformal prediction as the bound um, and still sort of hold strongly. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's some way to sort of combine some of these approaches to, to make something potentially exciting in that avenue as well. Any questions? Um, good. So I think uh, what we do is uh, use the general login for just a few minutes, right? Uh, and have a discussion with the community. Uh, maybe don't go too far. We'll come out soon. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, on Zoom. I'm going to end the recording now. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming.